Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the different types of capillaries. Okay, so in this video what we want to do now is talk about fenestrated capillaries. So, let me um, draw another picture. So again, fenestrated capillaries are around the same size as endo, um, sorry, as um, continuous capillaries, so they're very small little tubes. So we'll draw a nice tube again, okay? Only this time, the endothelial cells have fenestrations in. Now, I believe fenestra is the old word for a window, and that quite nicely describes what these fenestrations are. They're little windows in the side of the endothelial cells. So we're now drawing a fenestrated capillary. Okay, so I told you that uh, these are around the same size as the continuous capillaries. So again, they're around one cell thick, a single blood uh, cell can move through this capillary and fill up the entire lumen, okay? And here we have this one endothelial cell surrounding the whole of the capillary, okay? And here is the lumen of the capillary here, shown in red. Now, you'll then have multiple of these endothelial cells again, so here's one, here's another one, here's another one, etc., and we'll put on their nuclei. Here's a nucleus, here's a nucleus, here's a nucleus. And again, these um, cells are joined together by um, tight junctions, and occasionally you'll have tight junctions being missed out, and that will uh, give you an intercellular cleft. So we've got tight junctions, intercellular clefts. So in blue, these are tight junctions, intercellular clefts, not in blue. Okay, so where we don't have tight junctions between the boundaries of two cells, that's an intercellular cleft. And again, surrounding this, um, surrounding these endothelial cells, you will have a basement membrane. So, what's the difference between these fenestrated capillaries and the continuous capillaries? Because everything I've told you now is exactly the same so far. Well, basically, in these little cells, what you have is little holes in the cells, basically. So if you imagine taking this endothelial cell and sticking your finger into the side of it and just, uh, you know, in producing an invagination. So let me produce this picture. So if we have our endothelial cell here, okay, like so. Here's our endothelial cell. Here's its nucleus. And here comes our finger producing this invagination. Okay, what we're going to do is continue this invagination right down to the point that we actually burst through the other side, and we'll create this little uh, cylinder through the middle of the capillary endothelial cell, basically. And this little hole is known as a fenestration, okay? And that word, as I say, comes from the word fenestra, which means uh, window, I think. So it's a little window in the side of the endothelial cell. These little holes are also known as pores. Now, fenestrated capillaries are absolutely full of these holes. So you'll have another one here, another one here, another one here, another one here, and they go all over the place. Okay? So every one of these endothelial cells will have a huge number of these little pores in the side of it. Okay, now, uh, again, these little pores are too small to allow cells to move through them. In addition, they have mechanisms to stop um, to stop coagulation factors moving through them. So let me just explain what these mechanisms to prevent coagulation factors from moving through them are. Uh, so um, if we um, look at the side along picture of this, if we look at the um, cross sectional view of this, so here's our cross section of this fenestrated capillary. Okay, here's our endothelial cell nucleus. Okay, right, and here is our nucleus here. Right, and then underneath you'll have the basement membrane. Now, I haven't actually drawn any fenestrations in here yet. Uh, all that's over here is the gap between the two halves of the cell. Okay, but now I'll just add in the fenestration. So you'll have loads of little tunnels through the um, cell, basically. These little pores or fenestrations. Now, basically, you still have the glycocalyx, okay? So 
uh, not in that colour, in light green. We still have these polysaccharides all over the apical surface of our cells, and these cover over the um, fenestra, basically. Okay, so you still have the glycocalyx over these fenestra. So you have this polysaccharide uh, layer that covers the um, interluminal uh, side of the um, fenestra, uh, fenestra, or fenestration, sorry, fenestra is the word for window. Right, so this is the glycocalyx. And when you've got the glycocalyx covering over uh, the luminal side of this pore, then that's known as the diaphragm of the fenestration. Okay, so this little portion of the glycocalyx that covers this pore is known as the diaphragm. Okay, and it's this diaphragm that prevents uh, the coagulation factors from going out of the blood through this pore. I mean, the pore is too small for a platelet to fit through, so you don't need to worry about platelets getting out and causing uh, the activation of the hemostatic pathway, but you do have to worry about the coagulation factors, and it's the diaphragm that stops them getting out, so you don't have to worry about uh, activating the coagulation cascades. Okay, right, so uh, that's the structure of a fenestrated capillary, and you find these, the sort of archetypal example of where you find fenestrated capillaries is in the capillaries within a renal glomerulus, okay? So, we'll now look at the final type of capillary. So the final type of capillary is known as a discontinuous capillary, or it's also often called a sinusoidal capillary, so discontinuous slash sinusoidal capillary, okay, and these are generally found in the liver or the spleen, okay, so they're found in the liver is the archetypal example where you find uh, discontinuous or sinusoidal capillaries. Now these are generally bigger than fenestrated capillaries and continuous capillaries, so let's draw a bigger capillary, so a bigger tube, Okay, so they can fit slightly more than one cell within them. Okay, so here, and they might have to have two endothelial cells or so, making up a single side. Okay, so here's that, and then the tube will continue. And now the huge difference between these cells and the continuous capillaries is that these are going to be discontinuous. So if we draw some endothelial cells, so here's this endothelial cell, then it's joined to this endothelial cell. And basically, these discontinuous or sinusoidal capillaries, they have hardly any tight junctions, okay? So let me draw their nuclei in here. So the cells have a huge number of intercellular clefts in between them, and not many tight junctions, which is why these this type of a capillary is no... Oh, actually, the nucleus of this one should be here. Uh, which is why this type of a capillary is known as a discontinuous capillary, because the endothelium isn't one continuous layer. Okay, so you will have some tight junctions, so let's say maybe there's a little bit of tight junction here, a little bit here, but most of the junctions between endothelial cells are these um, intercellular clefts. So this is a tight junction, okay, whereas all the other uh, junctions are intercellular clefts. Okay, you still have the glycocalyx on the uh, luminal side of the um, endothelial cells, and then the final difference between these discontinuous capillaries and the continuous capillaries is that if we look at the basement membrane that lines these endothelial cells, in the case of the discontinuous or sinusoidal capillary, it's not one continuous layer, basically. You also have holes in the basement membrane. So if I draw a cross-sectional view of this, okay, so here is the outer aspect. Here are these two endothelial cells making up uh, the endothelium of the discontinuous capillary. Okay. And here are the nuclei of these two endothelial cells, one here, one here. Then basically the basement membrane is not one continuous thing that goes all the way around now. It's got holes in it. Okay, so this is the other reason that uh, these are known as discontinuous capillaries, because 
Not only are, is their endothelium discontinuous, it's got these intercellular clefts in between the endothelial cells, but also the basement membrane is discontinuous. Okay, so these discontinuous capillaries, they leak a lot. They're far leakier than the continuous capillaries um, because they have more intercellular clefts. But again, remember that the intercellular clefts will not allow cells to move through, and they will not allow the coagulation factors to move through. So that's how you prevent uh, the hemostatic pathway from being triggered. Okay, right. So, now let's discuss the mechanisms by which you can transport things uh, out of the uh, blood into the uh, tissue fluid, okay? So, one mechanism is that, um, and this applies for all of the cells at the moment, one mechanism is that you can just get diffusion right across the endothelial cells. So, the first mechanism is diffusion. And the bare essentials, such as um, oxygen and carbon dioxide, so oxygen and carbon dioxide, these uh, can use this mechanism basically. Uh, so oxygen and carbon dioxide can just diffuse straight across uh, the endothelial cells because they are so unpolar molecules, they're completely unpolar, which means that um, they will diffuse, well they, will d they can move through the phospholipid bilayers easily. Okay, so oxygen and carbon dioxide will move across the endothelial cells. So oxygen will come out of the blood because there's a concentration gradient favouring its movement out, and then carbon dioxide will go into the blood because, again, there's a concentration gradient favouring the movement of CO2 in. Okay, the second mechanism that you can have is you can have an actual transport mechanism. So certain things can be actually transported across the endothelial cells, transportation, okay, and glucose is often transported across endothelial cells, okay, um, so there are different mechanisms by which you can transport things across endothelial cells, so for instance, certain things can just be transported by proteins that are in both membranes, so it'll be transported across this membrane, then it'll go into the cytoplasm, and then transported across the basolateral membrane, okay? Alternatively, there are some things that will actually be uh, endocytosed into vesicles, and then the vesicle will be transported across the cell, and then exocytosed on the basolateral side, okay? So both of those are forms of transportation. The third option that you have available to you is that you can take the paracellular route, okay? So the paracellular route is that you can go through uh, the uh, inter intercellular clefts, so these gaps between the cells, okay? And the m famous example of something that will go through the paracellular route is water, and because water is very polar, so it has a harder time than oxygen and CO2 actually just diffusing across the membrane. Uh, but it therefore goes through the, but one of the mechanisms that's available to it is the paracellular route. And fourthly, if you've got a fenestrated capillary, you can also go through the fenestrations, okay? Uh, but as I say, fenestrated capillaries aren't as common as uh, continuous capillaries, so this might not always be a mechanism by which you can actually get out of the capillary. Okay, so those are the three different types of capillaries. In the next video, what we'll start to look at is uh, the activation of endothelial cells in the inflammatory response.